our next speaker. Um, very pleased to have here uh, Ms. Robin Engelmeyer. Um, Robin works with Strausser Nature's Helpers. Uh, she holds a BS in Landscape Design and Horticulture from Temple University. She's been employed as a senior landscape architect, a designer, project coordinator at Strausser Nature's Helpers for over 10 years now. Robin has been designing landscapes utilizing native plants for over 20 years. Her landscape design always takes into account minimizing turf, native plantings in layers with living mulch, drainage patterns, maintenance reduction, pollinator habitats, invasive plant management, and other ecological objectives. In addition to her degree, Robin is also a level two certified Chesapeake Bay landscape professional of both installation and design. So Robin. Okay. Hello. How is everybody today? Do I have any plant people in the audience? A few. Okay. I'm going to mix it up and we're going to be talking plants today. Excuse me. So my name is Robin. I work um, in East Stroudsburg with Strasser Nature's Helpers. We're a landscape contract firm. And um, I'm blessed actually to have found uh, Strasser Nature's Helpers. We um, do a lot of uh, more environmentally friendly landscape design and installations. Uh, and I have been able to really take my uh, designs and our installation, um, the part installation part of our company in that direction. Uh, and uh, on that vein, I'm going to speak a little bit uh, before we start the presentation to what Rob had said earlier and uh, talk a little bit about collaboration. Um, a lot of uh, landscape contractors, um, we get, uh, we do bid build, we also do design build. Uh, when I get bid build projects across my desk, um, oftentimes, unfortunately, I see a lot of uh, invasive plant material uh, spec on the plant lists. And um, if there's one thing you can take away from today's presentation, that would be that there really is a native plant for any invasive plant species that you would want to plug into a planting design. So. Um, if, if you can take anything away, I would, I would recommend that being it. Um, along the lines of collaboration and bid build work, um, within uh, that subject, I, I often get plans across my desk. And in one time in particular, I got a call to go out to um, a hospital, Pocono Medical Center. Uh, if anybody's from the East Stroudsburg area, Stroudsburg area, you're familiar with Pocono Medical Center, East Brown Street. Uh, and they were in the process of enlarging the campus. They had a parking area, lots H and J, um, right on East Brown Street, and I got called to a pre-bid meeting. Um, we started to go over the plant material and what they were looking for wrapping around this embankment. There's a wall there, the parking lot, and an embankment wrapping around uh, the, the front of the parking lot. Um, I was told that I, I was bidding on, they had wanted to see Pachysandra and um, ground cover juniper. And that's what they wanted to put on this embankment in the full sun, um, blazing hot sun, uh, next to a parking lot, which I knew um, in the winter was going to have a lot of you know snow and ice removal, therefore salt in the planting beds. Um, a lot of ice melt, ice, snow piled on top of the planting beds. And uh, I, I knew that this wasn't a really great idea. So um, I spoke up because I feel like that's my responsibility as a landscape designer who you know, really wants to find a more ecological solution. And um, I just said, you know, it's, it's not going to work. Um, you know, not only are the plant materials, you know, not the right choice because they're not native plants, but they're not the right choice because they're not going to um, survive for the application that you're looking for. Uh, so I went back to the office and decided I wasn't bidding on that job, uh, but I was going to write an email and say, hey, 
you know, let me design you something that will function properly and will be more environmentally friendly. Uh, so they accepted um, my proposal and I designed a um, native plant, uh, basically um, parking lot buffer. And if you drive by there today, uh, we have since installed it. And we used um, native grasses, native perennials. We did use uh, some um, ground cover junipers, but um, we, we, it's beautiful. It's, it's not a monoculture of Pachysandra. It's grasses, perennials. It's doing the job of erosion control. It can take the salt, uh, and um, it also is a, a nice wildlife habitat. So um, there are always um, environmental solutions or more ecological solutions for um, plant material that you uh, may, may want to propose, and you'll see some of those coming up in the presentation. So plant this, not that. Um, the simple native plant sub substitutions that you can make uh, for Northeast PA and beyond. So what are introduced non-native and invasive plants? Many of you may know the answer to this, but basically an introduced or non-native plant is one that has been brought into our area or region from another country or another region. Um, an invasive plant is one, however, that has become a weed pest, one that grows aggressively and spreads and displaces other native plants, animals, and habitat functions. Um, most invasive plants have been introduced to an area from other regions, um, and they no longer have those natural pests and diseases and predators to keep them in check. However, not all introduced or non-native plants are invasive. So what makes a plant species invasive? Um, plants that produce copious amounts of seed. Uh, to name a few um, that we'll be looking at uh, later, um, barberry, uh, burning bush, um, they produce copious amounts of seed. Um, plants that have few natural predators. Uh, for instance, the deer don't eat them. <coughs> plants that are difficult to kill. Um, many plants, Japanese knotweed for one, uh, you can't just simply dig it up. Um, you can't just simply cut it down and spray it. Um, it requires um, a lot more time and effort. Um, plants that often grow well in disturbed areas or in a wide variety of situations. So commonly used invasive plants in the built landscape along with inappropriate planting practices are essentially degrading our ecosystems by um, displacing native plant habitat and animal habitat, um, fracturing wildlife habitat, increasing stormwater management issues. Um, they provide a negative contribution to our food chain, as well as they have the ability to alter the soil chemistry. Here you see a typical foundation planting. Um, doesn't have to be a foundation planting. Oftentimes you see this in typical commercial um, build work with large areas of exposed, exposed mulch and just dotted plants, oftentimes invasive plants, uh, in the landscape. Those large areas of exposed mulch are not doing any, not providing any benefit to the environment. Um, they allow water to just shed off, as well as um, they allow weeds to uh, freely come in and grow. Also, overabundance of turf grass. Um, overabundance of turf grass in a lot of areas where it can be buffer planting beds full of native plants to provide wildlife habitat, thus um, really knitting together our ecosystems uh, in the landscape, the woodland, instead of these large areas of turf. <coughs> So what are native plants? So a native plant is one that is indigenous to a particular area or region and basically was found here before the Europeans settled. Uh, the plant is considered native if, if it basically occurred naturally in this region or ecosystem without human introduction. And why do we want to use native plants as opposed to invasive plants? Um, essentially less labor, water, and chemical input. 
Um, they want to be in the area where we are planting them. That's where they're adapted to. And therefore, they require less of these inputs. Uh, they're host and nectar sources. Um, some people could argue that um, some non-native or invasive plants are host and nectar sources, but they're really not those um, predominant sources that the animals need, that the butterflies need, that the birds need, with all the right nutrients. They aid in stormwater management, and you'll see on the next slide um, the difference, which is amazing, between the root systems of um, non-native plants versus native plants. They're a wonderful wildlife habitat. And they help us provide a sense of place. Um, oftentimes, um, with the build of strip malls and the um, essential plant palette that you normally see, we're kind of losing that sense of place in our landscape and in our towns and in our regions. So here you can see just the difference that I'm talking about in the roots of the non-native plants versus the native plants. Um, Spirea, which is a very common, very commonly specked plant in the built landscape. Uh, Daylilies, perennial fountain grass, such as hamlin grass, and then your general fescue or turf. Buffalo grass, for instance, a native turf grass. Prairie drop seed, and this is eight feet versus three feet. Black-eyed Susan, and then a really beautiful shrub, which we'll go into depth a little more later, the common nine bark, at a 16 feet root depth. Obviously, in some applications, maybe a, a high root depth is not advisable, so you would have to think about that, but in most applications, you really, you know, those roots really help um, in stormwater functioning. So the benefits of using native plants in the landscape are many. Um, so again, the reduction of stormwater, the reduction of water use, decreased pest and disease issues, wildlife habitat, energy efficiency, as well as the reduction of chemical fertilizers. I just want to run a few, um, run through a few pictures of some native plant planting applications. Here we just have some native plants in the landscape. And I want you to, while you're looking at all these slides, just keep in your mind what they all have in common. So here we just have a slide of some different native plantings. Um, now here we have a, a really nice, um, some pictures of some beautiful bioswales. Whereas um, today maybe you'll see drainage areas that are just grass and then the um, maintenance company is expected to go in there and mow and maintain these areas when they're, they're swales. So oftentimes throughout the year they're going to be wet, which makes mowing um, really uh, not a favored thing to do many times of the year. So uh, bioswales, why not? Constructed wetlands. Rain gardens. Um, rain gardens are simple, easy uh, BMPs, um, and they, uh, even the homeowner can do it. Layers of plantings. Um, so instead of just, like we looked at that first slide that had the shrubs just dotted throughout the landscape, we like <coughs> layers of plantings. You want to start with the ground plane and the ground cover, move on to your perennial layer, your shrub layer, your understory trees, and then your canopy trees, just like you see in the woodland. The woodland was designed for a functioning ecosystem. Massing of ground covers with native plants, what I like to call green mulch or living mulch. Why are we using mulch? We've, we've gotten into this age where we're using mulch as sort of like the carpet like you would walk into your house and you'd see a beautiful area rug. People are, people are using mulch like it's meant to be sort of a design feature in the landscape. And meadows. So can anyone tell me from looking at um, those past few slides of native plants in the landscape what one common feature is? They're all healthy. They're all healthy. They all have 
<laughs> flowers, but they all have a, a wide variety, but they all, you, did, you, did you see any mulch? No, you didn't see any mulch. You didn't see wide swaths, wide areas of mulch, and you really didn't see a lot of turf, just large areas of turf grass. Um, so a healthy, functioning ecosystem. So now we're gonna really talk plants. Um, so invasive plants, we've learned about what invasive plants are, we've learned about what native plants are, we've seen some healthy functioning ecosystems. Um, now we're gonna go through some invasive plants that I suspect a lot um, on plants that come across my desk and they're native substitutes. Um, so Norway maple, um, Norway maple was once very popular um, and just the straight species itself was often used uh, as a shade tree or street tree. Um, now you don't see Norway maple too much, but you do still see the Crimson King maple, predominantly for that um, burgundy color all year round. Um, instead, why don't we substitute a native maple, a sugar maple, a red maple? You're not gonna get that burgundy color three seasons, but you will get beautiful fall color, and it will be a native plant. Tree of Heaven. Now, I know, hopefully no one's planting the Tree of Heaven, um, but it is out there, and quite possibly some people do like the texture or the feel of Tree of Heaven, um, and in some areas uh, where you're doing removal for development, um, there may be Tree of Heaven. So if you do like that texture, that feel, um, and you do want to provide a wildlife uh, benefit, you could try Staghorn Sumac beautiful fall color, and then the fruits, and they actually are edible. And then this is my, one of my favorites, um, the calorie pear. So if anybody designs with plants, any landscape architects, who's, who's still using calorie pear or sees calorie pear spec? You don't see it spec too much anymore? Okay. Um, I, I, I do still see it spec. Um, it, it does have a wide variety of, of applications. There are many varieties of calorie pear. You used to see it spec a lot more. There are some maintenance issues with calorie pear. It can be a hazard um, as far as it has weak, what we call weak crotches. Um, so, um, but there are wonderful native substitutes. One of my favorite native substitutes is the service berry. Um, beautiful blooms uh, for one of the first trees to bloom in the spring. Uh, beautiful white flowers. Looks very much like a pear. Um, fruit, edible, delicious, uh, and wonderful fall color as well. Um, there is, if you're, in, if you're familiar with this area, there's a the Wise Shopping Center um, down at Eagle Valley Corners, and all of their island plantings are ca actually um, service berry. Um, Washington Hawthorne, that is another wonderful substitution. Again, beautiful white flowers, um, great fruit in the fall, nice fall color, um, and it does have thorns. There are some uh, variety of uh, Hawthorns that do not have thorns. Uh, and then there's always the flowering dogwood, which again, white spring flowers. Maybe slightly different application, but a beautiful flowering tree. So the empress tree, Polonia. Um, we don't see it up here too much. We do see it in the Philadelphia area a lot. Again, not generally specked or planted. Um, however, it is a tree that oftentimes, um, I know a lot of my residential clients will say, oh, what's that beautiful purple flowering tree? Um, so, you know, in order to try to give them a, a substitute for that, that color, I often uh, tend toward the eastern red bud which I'm sure you all know, beautiful native tree um, to, to this area, wonderful um, spring color, as well as um, usually a yellowish fall color as well. So um, the Northern Catalpa. Um, so whereas the Empress tree has big, kind of hefty purple flowers, the Northern Catalpa has big, hefty white flowers, um, kind of the same stature. And then again, the flowering dogwood. So this is um, my arch nemesis, uh, Japanese barberry. Um, I still see it specked all the time. 
Um, I know that they sell it everywhere. And when we talk about copious amounts of seed um, and why native plants are so prolific in the landscape, just take a look at this. We've got, that's all seed. That's all fruit. So this is Japanese barberry in the understory of a woodland. And really, there, there's no room for anything else to grow in there. Um, so I know that a lot of people like to spec this nice fall, this nice color, the burgundy color, or the chartreuse yellow color in the landscape, and, and that's why it's often used. Uh, however, we do have wonderful native substitutes. We have the nine bark, um, physocarpus, opulifolius. We have a wonderful um, chartreuse yellow as well as a burgundy, as well as there's a bunch of other um, different color physocarpus, and anymore they're really making different shapes and different sizes for all different applications. Uh, the Virginia Sweet Spire, it's not burgundy all year round, however, it does have the beautiful red fall color. Um, this is one of my favorites, fairly new on the scene here. Um, it's called Dyer Villa Lemisera, or the Northern Bush Honeysuckle. This is a variety called Kodiak Orange, and it just has this beautiful, beautiful um, orangey burgundy color. And then the Low Bush Blueberry. Uh, the Dyer Villa is very deer resistant as well. So, talking about the um, Barberry a little bit more. Um, it actually has been linked, there have been studies done, and it has been linked to um, uh, increased tick population. So just, you know, if you're trying to dissuade a client or um, yourself as to why you may not want it in your landscape, that's, that's a really pretty serious reason. Um, so. Butterfly bush. Every, everybody wants a butterfly bush in their yard. And why can't we have it? Well. This is actually a path um, with the woodland on either side and just straight down either side, that's all butterfly bush. Um, it's very invasive. So we have tons of native plants and this doesn't even scratch the surface. These are just a few favorites of the butterflies, but um, we have so many native plants that are butterfly friendly that butterfly bush is not necessary. We have, this is the button bush, if you want an actual bush. Um, Clethra, there's, uh, or summer sweet, there's uh, the white and pink varieties, all different shapes and sizes. We have the butterfly weed, as well as New York, New York iron weed, if you want something that sort of gives you that loud shout of purple color. The New York iron weed is wonderful. It gets about five feet tall in the landscape. And knotweed, again, I know None of you are planting knotweed, um, but I believe we've probably all, whether it's on our property or a property that we like to hike or, or fish at, um, I believe we've all encountered Japanese knotweed um, and know that it's a very, very serious invasive pest and it's very hard to get rid of. Um, riparian buffer projects are just um, a bear, uh, you know, trying to, to keep up with, you know, you, you remove it and then you have to go back and you really have to keep up on the maintenance. Um, so, you know, if we can remove it and you have the opportunity to do that, uh, some wonderful native substitutions. Um, we've got the Pussy Willow that takes the same, you know, stream side application, um, Silky Dogwood, as well as if you just like want that look of the Japanese knotweed, you can go with the goat's beard. A multiflora rose. Um, multiflora rose, don't see cultivated in the landscape. Jap uh, rugosa rose you do, however, and I do still see that spec. Um, however, there are some wonderful native substitutes. The pasture rose and the prairie rose, which I just used um, and was specced actually on a really nice detention basin project that I installed. And Japanese spirea, this is a big one. This is, um, everybody uses Japanese spirea, like everybody uses Japanese barberry. Um, there are some wonderful native substitutes. We've got the steeple bush, which is actually a native spirea, as well as the shiny leaf meadowsweet, which is again another native spirea. 
And this is actually, she's standing in a patch of spirea. So it is invasive. And then there are some invasive viburnums. Um, one of a favorite, uh, double file viburnum, as well as uh, viburnum opulus. Um, and we have beautiful native viburnums to use. Um, cranberry bush viburnum, maple leaf viburnum. We have the smooth leaf, leaf hydrangea, which really has that big white flower. Um, so no reason really why we have to yet use the invasive species. Burning bush. Everybody wants burning bush. Um, it has every, it's, it's everybody's basically thought of what they think of for a, a shrub in fall. They think of the burning bush. Um, and again, we talk about copious amounts of seed. That's all seed. And this is burning bush throughout the woodland. And if you've ever, um, in our area, driven up 447 in the fall, headed up to Canadensis, um, it's just burning bush all on the left-hand side. Um, and then mixed in with a little barberry. Um, but there are some wonderful fall, um, fall color shrub, native shrubs. We've got the Eastern Wahoo, or the Euonymus autopropareus, and why not just use it because it's called Eastern Wahoo. Um, we've got the possum haw viburnum. Viburnum nudum, look at that fall color, it's beautiful. Nice, rich, glossy leaves, and then you have the added benefit of a flower. Burning bush doesn't even flower. Border privet, um, oftentimes used for hedges. Uh, why not use our native inkberry holly? Inkberry holly has some wonderful applications. Um, you can use it on wet sites. It's wonderfully salt tolerant. And then English ivy. So I talk about living mulch. Um, so why wouldn't I want to use some sort of ground cover? Well, I do want to use some sort of ground cover, but not just any ground cover and not English ivy. Look at that, that's a, that's a forest that's just being taken over the floor of English ivy. Um, why not use a native substitute? Well, it's not evergreen. Um, it provides beautiful fall color, as well as um, its great wildlife habitat, as well as wildlife food. And the akebia vine, um, I don't suspect on plants too much. Um, however, it is available still in plant catalogs. And this is what the chocolate vine does to a woodland. And why not use something that's beautiful and wildlife friendly, like the trumpet vine or Campsus radicans. And then our native pachysandra. Or I mean our, yeah, the Japanese pachysandra and our native pachysandra. Did, was anybody aware that we have a native pachysandra? Okay, we have a native pachysandra. <laughs> this is it. Um, use this. It might cost a little bit more, um, but actually it's, it's getting more um, available and uh, less expensive as propagation techniques are developed. Um, doesn't have the shiny leaf that the Japanese pachysandra does, but it serves the exact same application and it does, it's not invasive. And then periwinkle. We see periwinkle everywhere. It's, it's specked on any job that I see that has ground cover. Um, this is periwinkle left unchecked. And it's creeping up the back hillside and it's, it's just all over and it doesn't allow any of our native plants to, to shine through on the woodland floor. Um, let's use some native substitutes. We've got barren strawberry, woodland phlox, creeping phlox. I mean, you almost can't tell the difference. Um, and the barren strawberry uh, is very deer resistant. Oriental bittersweet. We've got a native variety for that too. And Japanese wisteria, look at that. That, Jap that Japanese wisteria, that trunk, climbs up the trunks of plant trees and can just literally pull them down. Um, it, it can climb up a trellis on your house and just literally pull it down. Um, this is our native wisteria. We have a native wisteria and it's beautiful. 
Maybe the, maybe the panicles aren't, aren't quite as long, but they're beautiful and they're fragrant. And then uh, clematis, uh, sweet autumn clematis, um, very invasive. We have a native substitute. It's virgin's bower, clematis virginiana. And Japanese honeysuckle, again, we have a native honeysuckle, Linocerus temporirens, and it's much more beautiful. It's got red flowers. It's a hummingbird magnet. Japanese stiltgrass. I know no one's planting Japanese stiltgrass. I hope no one's planting Japanese stiltgrass, but if for some reason you like that look in the landscape, just sort of that lush green carpet on the woodland floor, we do actually have a native grass that looks just like Japanese stoke grass and serves that same purpose, only it's not invasive. And our ornamental grasses. Ornamental grasses are wonderful. They're extremely carefree, they're maintenance free, um, and you should be using them on a lot of jobs, uh, specking them in a lot of applications. However, let's switch to native grasses. Um, they're extremely um, available, readily available in the trade, and they actually come in nice plug size, so they're very um, cost effective for any projects. Um, this is reed canary grass, which is uh, used a lot in the field. Let's, let's switch to big blue stem. Look at that beautiful fall color. Or um, Shenandoah switchgrass, a panicum, Shenandoah, which gets this lovely red tips in the fall. Or Indian grass, which has this sort of steel blue color. And then miscanthus. That's, this is a big one in the field. There's all different varieties of miscanthus. There's zebra grass, there's um, a striped variety, variegated variety. Um, let's look at our native substitutes. This is one of my favorites, uh, panicum or switchgrass. This one's called heavy metal. Um, it has this beautiful steel blue um, coloration and then it gets a really lovely yellow fall color as well. Um, we have Indian grass again, and the big blue stem. There's also little blue stem for uh, smaller or shorter applications. And fountain grass. This is hamlin grass. I think anybody that's ever worked with plants knows hamlin grass. It's used everywhere. Um, we, we have a native. This is a prairie drop seed, or sporobolus. Um, it's a wonderful, it's actually even more beautiful. It's more graceful. And then Dame's Rocket, um, not, not really specced as a perennial planting, but if you're searching for that look, um, we have a wonderful native substitute. We have Carolina Phlox and Phlox Paniculata, or Summer Phlox. <coughs> and Purple Loosestrife. Um, once able to be purchased in the nursery trade, Purple Loosestrife has run rampant, as you can see, just devouring our wetlands and wet areas and roadsides and taking over um, in, these, in these areas, these more difficult areas. Um, we have beautiful plants that really, you know, I remember actually working, at, I worked at a garden center um, and people would come in asking, this was many, many years ago when Purple Oostrife was still sold, um, which may date me, sorry. Uh, people would ask for Purple Oostrife and so I'd always lead them over to Leatris. Um, because it's a very similar appearance and it's a native plant. Um, swamp milkweed, queen of the prairie, blue verving, and bishop's weed. Um, it's a great ground cover, but it's very invasive. Um, you could you know, use a wild sarsaparilla or a Canadian wild ginger uh, and get that ground cover effect with a non-invasive plant. Garlic mustard. Now, again, I don't think any of you are planting garlic mustard, although it is edible and very good for you. Um, but there are wonderful native substitutes for those situations. Um, golden ragwort, Pacara aria. Pacara aria is a fabulous plant. Um, it can take a multitude of uh, situations. Nest flower, Eupatorium colostinum, with its 
lovely lavender flowers. And lesser celandine, lesser, cel lesser celandine with its uh, ground cover effect and its little yellow flowers. Look at, we have for two different applications. We have marsh marigold for the wetter sites and we have chrysogonum or green and gold for the drier sites. And fennel. Well, you may still want to plant fennel so that you can eat it. Um, we do have a native substitute if you're looking for that uh, flower texture. And this is called zizia. And again, one of my favorite plants just to say. So why not plant it? Zizia aria or golden alexanders. And daylilies. We do see daylilies everywhere. Um, again, there are many, many native substitutes as far as different perennials, um, and there are native lilies. So the Canada lily, the wood lily, the Turks kept lily, they're a little more finicky than your typical day lily. However, um, if, if you need something that's just going to be a beast and can grow anywhere, there are many other native substitutes. So. If you're looking for a little more native plant information, um, oh, I did just want to touch on, because um, someone brought it to my attention earlier, um, Craig, that I guess you had made a comment earlier about um, salt tolerance of plants and snow plowing. And um, so we, we do talk about rain gardens a lot and just a thought that's sort of been um, creeping around and a conversation that a bunch of us have been having is more about snow gardens um, and thinking about where salt gets piled in the landscape um, when you're designing as an architect or an engineer and talking about parking lots and buffer strips and plantings that are going to go in between or on the edge um, to be aware and be thinking about um, where the salt is going to go. Um, because it is a reality and if there's going to be plantings there they need to be salt tolerant and maybe it could you could even design a snow garden which would essentially be like a rain garden um, utilizing native plants and something that would be salt tolerant that would be able to um, filter those pollutants that are getting plowed with that snow so some native plant informational websites if you want a little more information and want to do some uh, self-educating. Um, nativeplant.org, um, they have wonderful information just about native plants um, and they also have great uh, sources for native plants, both wholesale and retail. Um, this is one of my favorite websites, um, naturalheritage.state.pa.us. Um, and there are um, these natural heritage sites for a multitude of different states, at least on the East Coast, um, from what I've explored. Um, but here you can find um, our native plant communities that are appropriate for the specific area that you're looking in, in Pennsylvania. You can actually find county inventories, species lists, and there's a tool, IMAP Invasives, to map invasive plants. So this is a really, really, this is a wealth of knowledge, uh, naturalheritage.state.pa.us. Then there's Plant Native, uh, or PA Native Plant Society.org. Uh, again, Native Plant Sources. This is a, a really great website for events that are happening, native plant related events, whether they're symposiums or plant sales, and just other resources. Um, and then choosenatives.org. Again, just various resources, um, sales and events, as well as articles related to native plants. And this um, will be on the web page for this uh, event. And then Northeast um, Native Plant Sources. So um, wholesale and retail, um, depending on what your application is. Um, there are, we have some wonderful sources right in this area. If you're from this area, if you're looking for wholesale, there's Todd Price Nursery in Canadensis. Um, I work with them uh, on a daily basis. And if they don't have a plant that I'm looking for, they will get it. Um, so a wonderful source in this area. Um, North Creek Nurseries, wonderful for their uh, plugs. I use their plugs a lot. They're native plant perennial, predominantly plugs. Uh, Pinelands Nursery, 
Octorero Nursery. They um, they have anything ranging from seedling size up to um, two, three, uh, five, seven gallon containers. Mid Atlantic Natives and AmericanNativePlants.com. Um, and as far as some retail sources. Um, some great garden centers in our area that I frequent regularly, Ross and Ross Garden Center and Stonewall Garden Center, they have a wealth of native plants and a wealth of knowledge. You can go there and you can get your uh, questions answered if you have questions on any native plants. As well as some websites, prairiemoon.com, prairie nursery, Ernst Seed, um, and American Native Nursery. Um, Earn Seed is wonderful. They will make you a seed mix. Um, if you have a specific application, you tell them your specs and they will make a seed mix for you, a native plant mix. So, um, and they'll actually provide you all the information to hopefully make your project a success. So, does anybody have any questions? Yes. Oh, um, hmm. Plants that will discourage deer for highway applications. Um, besides creating a physical barrier. <laughs> um, sure, sure. Um, I mean, there are more deer-resistant plants, obviously. Um, and, however, um, I don't know if there are any that actually deter them. I can't say that there would be. Anybody know of any plants that actually deter them? Any more questions? Two questions. Um, you recommended viburnum. Uh, lots of natives, some of them, if you have a list of the ones that are not attractive to the viburnum leaf beetle. Okay. Um, I I mean, I haven't had issues. Um, I don't specifically know. I can't really give you a concrete list. I haven't had, uh, Viburnum nudum can um, have issues. I, I have had problems with that, but um, the acerifolium, um, I have not had problems <laughs> with. So I can only speak to what I've had problems with or, or haven't had problems with. Um, my other question, do you do so recent um, studies have uh, had the connection <coughs> sources of the different cultivars of natives versus the species. Right. Are you recommending the species versus the cultivars if you're looking to do a dual application on these? It's... It, 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 it. It's kind of like a, we, ha we have this discussion on and off as to whether you want to stick with the straight species or whether you'll, you, could, you should use, um, I mean, purists will say stick with the straight species. That's really what our wildlife um, are adapted to. Uh, and, um, you know, I would personally say stick with the straight species unless you're really looking for a certain you know, if you want that chartreuse color, so you want to use the chartreuse yellow nine bark. You know, I mean, but but for your, I would, I I generally tend to use my basic plant palette is straight species, but it, I'll throw in some cultivars, um, and and that's not to say, you know, I also do throw in some. Um, this is my dirty little secret. I also do throw in some um, like specimen ornamental evergreens. Um, you know, uh, if, if I know they're not invasive, um, you know, there are applications for those as well. So I'm not saying you have to be a complete purist, um, but we want to try to benefit there where we can. The tree of heaven seems to be where the lantern fly is attracted to the staghorn sumac resistant to the lantern fly or does the lantern fly go for that? I don't know the answer to that question, but it is a completely different beast than the tree of heaven. So, and I haven't heard anything that says that it attracts the lantern I fly. Can't that. It, it, it does. It'll, it, it'll not attract it as greatly as the lanterns, um, but it'll still be attracted to it as well. So there you go. And, and, and I'll talk about that on the Native maples, do they attract the lantern fly as much as the non-native uh, maples? 
Um, the lantern fly is its, it's main tree that it goes after is the oleanthus tree. Yeah. Um, but if that tree isn't present, it can establish on other species as well. I, I have six dead red maples from lantern From lantern, there you go. And that's what I'm finding out that the lantern fly is also attracted to the maple tree. Right. But if there's an oleanthus tree there, it will go after the oleanthus tree first. Before it comes over to any of the other species. Yeah, and it's not very species specific, but it does favor the Alanthus. Do you have, um, when you were talking about the knot weed removal, do you have a best management of fermentarian buffers? So, what, what we've been doing um, is cotton spray and cotton spray. Um, so at least two applications and then constant monitoring, um, roughly cut to like a knee height, um, and then spray. Uh, generally, you want to spray with like a Roundup type product, um, as well as um, put in, um, there's a product called Oust, which is a pre-emergent. Um, and that product is used, you know, obviously if the, there's any seed present, um, it will stop the seed from germinating. Um, so you want to do that, and then um, you wait, and then it'll, it'll, you'll see it, it, it didn't die, so then you want to do it again. Um, and generally, at least two, you're going to need at least two applications, if not more. As being a beekeeper, I hate that word, roundup. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, when you start spraying for not of course you want to do it. When do you do that? When the flower is right and the bees are hitting it? So, um, generally what we do is cut first, right? So we cut and it's, it's like knee height, so it's not in flower. Um, unfortunately, I mean, it, if I could... If I could live in a perfect world and never have to use chemicals, I would. I take using chemicals very, you know, I don't take it lightly. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so bees, I know people love knotweed honey. Bees are very attracted to Japanese knotweed. I know, it's an issue. Um, but that's what, one of the reasons also why you cut and spray. Um, you cut so that it's not in flower. Um, hopefully there are no pollinators, you know, on it. Uh, when it starts to grow up, it's just vegetative. Um, and you spray also while it's low, so you're not you know, broadcasting the Roundup, and you're really just trying to spray the knotweed itself. And then how are you disposing of the cut? Or letting it lie. You don't want to transport it, um, because that's probably one of the worst things you can do. And if you're putting the oust, in with your Roundup, you're kind of taking care of that seed source. <coughs> yes? Uh, I had a riparian forested wetland with Japanese knotweed packing grass and lesser selenium. Okay. And not everybody has access to this, but I would encourage it. Uh, if you have anybody that has goats, it's taking care of the problem. Goats, they'll take care of every problem. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So the issue with that, however, I would think would be like, do you have anything, any vegetation there now? But the goats aren't in the area anymore. Correct. Okay. All right. So, but then the native plants did come back. Awesome. Good to know. Yes. Can you recommend a uh, ground cover or living mulch that um, you know won't die in the winter and provides a little stabilization in the off months? That won't die in the winter, so it'll be evergreen. Yeah, something that provides a little stabilization in the winter months. And, uh, what will you mulch? Um, are we talking sun or are we talking shade? Oh, either <laughs> one. Okay, so um, a couple of the the the. Um, Strawberry, that's a really great uh, bank stabilization. If you want a really good, there's also shrub ground covers, um, which one of my favorite, which I didn't show here today, um, is the ground cover of Grolo Sumac, which is a super bank stabilizer. 
Um, it's a little bit taller, so it's not going to be a low, low ground cover. And it's a shrub, but it uh, has beautiful fall color as well. And I'll give you my card, and you can call me, and we can talk about it more. But yeah. Anybody else? No. Sorry, we could only be so lucky. Um, silk grass is bad. I mean, it, it, the seed can stay viable in that soil for seven or more years. So it's just a constant battle, unfortunately. I mean, however you choose to get rid of it, it comes up and you either need to spray it or suffocate it, and you need to do that for a period of seven to 10 years. So, I mean, the best thing I can say is if you know you have it or you know it's outside of your property, do not let it come in. Like, be vigilant, which is difficult. I mean, we all have lives. We're not just out there scouting for invasive plants. But, <laughs> uh, well, some of us do. But, <laughs> but, um, but, but that, would be, that would be what I would say, you know, would be the best. Um, I mean, we planted a meadow a few years ago, and there was still grass there, and um, there's still still grass there. And, you know, um, the meadow's doing okay, but is it a really beautiful, nice native meadow? Um, there's still still grass there. So. I think we have time for one more question. Anybody else have anything burning? If not, there is actually a question box out front. There's a a bright pink box as you walk out and there's some uh, question cards on your table so if you didn't have time to answer ask a question or if it's something that you just didn't want to say out loud you can feel free to write it down and put it in the pink box and we will get your questions anyway a big uh, hand of applause for Thank Robin. You. Thank you.